this is an unbelievably exciting time in infrastructure, I think, because we're going through sometimes huge transitions. We're in the middle of a huge revolution, and uh, that creates challenges and opportunities, and uh, you know, both for large enterprise as well for a startup. Uh, you know, and these opportunities, if you leverage them, can give you a fantastic growth curve. So I want to give an enterprise's perspective of what's happening in software-defined infrastructure right now. But I want to start somewhere slightly different, and that's with uh, another trend, uh, which is called digitalization or digital transformation. So if you look at what's happening with many large companies today, there's clearly something changing, right? So here are some examples. You know, Elon Musk described Tesla as, as, as much as a software company as it is a car company. You know, Uber, biggest taxi company in the world, does not own taxis anymore. They're, they're a pure software provider. You know, Facebook becoming the number two or so in video now, not making any content themselves. They're relying on their users. But if you go through this list, right, all of these companies at the end of the day, have software as a core competency. For them, software is critical for their survival, and um, you know, it, it, their, their markets have been disrupted, and they're disrupting their markets. GE, I think, phrased that incredibly well when they said, you, know, you go to sleep as an industrial company, and you wake up as a software company. Right? So why is this happening, and why is this happening now? What's, what's driving this, this change in, in the competitive dynamics for, for large companies? And I personally think that this is primarily driven by a structural change that we're seeing in IT and in infrastructure. Because along with this revolution in, uh, on the business side, we're seeing a revolution on the, on the infrastructure side, where the model how we consume infrastructure is fundamentally changing. And to make that point, let me go back in history uh, a little bit. So when we started with IT, you know, the first model that evolved was were mainframes and workstations. I would buy uh, a spark station with a sun chip and a sun enclosure with Solaris, the operating system made by sun, everything by one vendor. Right? Or, or maybe an IBM mainframe, designed exactly the same way, everything from one vendor. And then the PC revolution happened, where suddenly, instead of everything being from one vendor, you had systems that were composed by multiple vendors. Intel was making a chip, Dell would put it in a case, and you would run Windows on it. Alternatively, you could take AMD with HP and Linux on top. And the effect of that was huge, it was phenomenal. Right? Everything changed. Every major software company today was founded during this time, right? If you count IBM as a, as a services company. Most of the market leaders before this transformation, you know, if you think about them, the big ones were, were Sun Microsystems, Digital Equipment, uh, Honeywell, Fujitsu, were no longer product companies afterwards. Most of them had disappeared. IBM is the only market leader that made it across. It was, it was a huge transition. And right now, we're in the middle of a similar transition. That's the transition to the cloud, where the big new thing is that the underlying infrastructure, you know, your, 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 your CPU, your, your system, um, some of the lower layers of the software can be consumed as a service, either in a private cloud or in a public cloud. But basically, if you deploy, develop, deliver software, you no longer have to worry about that part. And the prediction is that that'll have an equally huge effect on the entire industry. If you're a market leader, you're being challenged. If you're going to be a market leader in the future, you have to prove yourself. Some will make it, some won't. That's exciting. So coming back to these leaders that, that disrupt their respective markets, they're running on some of the most modern infrastructure you can think of. You know, like uh, some of these companies are the biggest early adopters of Amazon, for example. You know, Tesla certainly changed how you build compute for cars, right, with owning the entire software stack in the car and, and having huge back-end services that, you know, that, uh, that a car is constantly connected to and is constantly interfacing with. 
Uh, Citibank, for example, they're running one of the most sophisticated software-defined networks on the planet, or at least in the enterprise, right? The hyperscale, you have more of them. So these market leaders that are disrupting the industries, they're leveraging a next generation of infrastructure in a very, very efficient way. And I think this allows them to, to uh, disrupt their respective markets. So what does all of this mean for the IT organization of a typical enterprise? I mean, first of all, here's some numbers, and this is just some statistics we did in the, in the survey we did in the VMware customer base, right? A, a typical enterprise in the United States today, it's starting to move into the cloud. Total num the total percentage of workloads in the cloud is still very small. You know, we're looking at a less than 5%, but it's growing very rapidly, and we expect it to be in the tens of percent, uh, you know, only in, in two, three years from now. Interestingly enough, the, ma the majority are using public clouds, and the majority of those that are using public clouds are using multiple public clouds. And the very basic idea is nobody likes single vendor lock-in, right? You want to have hedge your bets and, and, and do, uh, try, try multiple things. And the, the clear leaders in the United States are, are Amazon and Azure. I think there's probably nothing surprising here. Now, I've talked to, I'm talking to probably somewhere between 100 and 200 you know, CIOs or directors of infrastructure, uh, VPs of infrastructure a year. And for them, the change to the cloud is incredibly hard. And I want to give you a little bit of an appreciation of what the different models are that these different enterprises use to move into the cloud and why this is so hard for them. Because depending on what model you use, you're actually facing a different set of challenges. And let me start with a, with a very practical example. So um, this is Bryce Canyon, right? beautiful national park in, in Utah, if you haven't gone there. You yeah, absolutely should. I, I did a road trip there last year with the whole family, and unfortunately, I had to work because I hadn't finished my slide yet for another keynote at VMworld in, in Vegas. That was a few weeks later, and so I was sitting there and, and working. And I wasn't actually working here. You know, I wish uh, I was actually working here, which is the coffee shop in the parking lot of the of the lodge. Uh, but they have Wi-Fi. It's the only place where you can get Wi-Fi there. And so I was, you know, working my slides. And uh, also on an Amazon demo we were showing. And um, here's, a, here's a packet trace, you know, a network packet trace of, uh, of me working in that national park. And uh, you know, it might be hard to read, but basically what it shows you is that the packets are going from the, the national park service to a local service provider to a backbone operator to a peering point and then to Amazon. It's a very, very typical packet trace. This gentleman is Basque Iyer. He's the CIO of both VMware as well as uh, Dell at the moment. So my CIO. And so here are two questions. The first one is, which of these actual switches and routers are under his control? Any idea? None, right? These are all owned by, by different entities. So second question, if because of me working there's a big data breach, will he still get fired? Probably yes, right? So, so that for me is really the new thing about IT in the age of cloud. You have zero control over the hardware anymore, but you still have 100% of the responsibility as an IT team. And that makes your job much, much harder. Right? It means you need new technologies, you need a new stack, you need a new approach to doing things. So if you look at all the different transitions that are happening in the enterprise and IT at the moment, it's very confusing. Right? And, uh, so this is sort of a, a laundry list here of all the things. You know, you're going from a, a hardware-defined data center to a software-defined data center. Um, you, you're automating how you interface with your infrastructure. You're going from a manual model, you know, logging to every switch to, to more of a DevOps model. Just talk to one big uh, Wall Street bank, they now have networking DevOps broken out as a separate team, which is, you know, that's an interesting sign. First time I've, I've seen that. You know, your, your applications, you're going for the big monolithic ones to microservices. That means you're changing the infrastructure. You know, you may use something like a, more like a containerized platform um, to, to deploy these, um, these, you know, the applications and the associated data services. Your physical appliances, you know, your load balancers, your firewalls, they're moving to virtual appliances or just to generic services that you consume. You know, you, and you probably have to change your organization as well. You have to get rid of the, of the silos. 
And then the, the momentum for decision making is shifting from central IT more to the business units. So there's a lot of things happening at the same time. So what I want to try to do is, is structure this a little bit and talk about a couple of models that we're seeing in the enterprise and you know, to, to, so we can basically tackle these one by one. And let me start with the, the, the oldest one and I think the, the, the best understood one, that's the private cloud. So a traditional data center you know, has servers, compute, as uh, servers, networking storage, um, maybe security and ops as additional teams. You typically have a fairly siloed organizations uh, you know, where you have a director of infrastructure and beneath the different teams run, run each of these silos. And classically, most of the provisioning, at least outside of the, the server part, was done in a very manual way. Right? So you, you log into a switch, you configure it you know, with, with command line arguments that pretty much hasn't changed over the past two decades. The idea of a private cloud is to say, we're going to automate this. Right? So my internal folks can go to a self-service portal and just create a new development setup and start using it. If they don't need it anymore, they can shut it down. Going from you know, provisioning that takes weeks to provisioning that takes seconds. Very, very straight, straightforward. And these private clouds, they're still happening, right? There, uh, it's uh, a lot of transformation going on there. Now, some companies are going a step further, and they want to build hybrid clouds. And, and what they mean with that is that they want to have some on-prem compute resources and a public cloud provider, and manage them in a somewhat coherent way. And it turns out this is really, really hard for them, because if you're a classical enterprise, You've built an application stack you know, around your F5 load balancers, around your you know, Palo Alto Networks firewalls. You, know, you, you have a certain processes how you configure firewalls and, and the local network. And now you want to go to a native Amazon, and everything is different. You don't have your load balance anymore. You don't have those firewalls anymore. You now have security groups. You know, you, the reliability of an individual machine is much, much lower. So you should probably build your applications in a different way. It's making it so the, the lift and shift type operations incredibly hard. In many cases, it's essentially a replatforming exercise where you need to take something, put it in a different type of application container, change the networking model, do changes in the application before you can really move it into a public cloud. So, you know, and um, let me insert one quick plug here for VMware. You know, one way to tackle this is with a cloud infrastructure that basically is the same in the public, like a, with an IaaS infrastructure, it's the same in the public cloud and on prem. There's a couple of companies, like for example VMware and, and Microsoft, they're starting to build these systems and roll them out. So for example, at VMware, what we're doing is we have this partnership with AWS. We can get a complete VMware stack on top of AWS, and then you can, and then you can take that stack, take your, the same stack that, you, that you're running on premises, take your vCenter, which is basically your, your management layer for this, span it across, you know, take your NSX network, span them across. But the parts that are running on the cloud can access all the public cloud services. So you can build a really nice hybrid cloud where you can take the same workload and either deploy it in the public cloud or on-prem. You're still using a classic IaaS abstraction, so we're not doing containers here yet. But you know, for somebody who wants to lift and shift, somebody who wants to get excess capacity or wants to start migrating, this is a fantastic solution. And then the, the third approach that people are taking is they're going natively into the public cloud. And this is hard, right? If you, so if here's the, a laundry list of, of all the, the differences, but uh, let me start with a very practical example. So I'm, I'm running, I'm running uh, proud two Amazon workloads for me personally. You know, one is my little blog, which I haven't updated for two years, and the other is the game server for my eight-year-old kid. Apparently, that's what an eight-year-old in Silicon Valley needs these days. And you know, that both of those instances, I would say, an average get rebooted about once every six months for some reason, or you know, I have to reboot them because they like they drop a file system or something like that. So the reliability of a single instance at the moment is still relatively low. Now, you can still build very reliable applications up there, but you have to build them differently. Right? You take containers, you build a scale-out app, you know, you have a swarm, you distribute it over availability zones, and suddenly you have an incredibly robust application probably more robust than anything you can build in a data center today. But you have to change how you develop software. And for us in Silicon Valley here, that's an easy thing. 
if you are you know, somewhere in uh, you know, the middle, middle America, you have a workforce that has written you know, ja monolithic Java apps for the past 20 years, that's a very hard change to execute. Right? And it'll take time. I'm, I'm a techie, but I, I always believe changing technology is much easier than changing people. So it'll be a while before enterprises can make that shift. They're starting, you know, we're seeing this ramp nicely, but it'll be a long transition. So putting all of this together, where does this leave us, right? And the, the, the long-term trend I'm seeing in the leading enterprises is they're starting to think about a multi-cloud future where they really want to be in a number of different clouds. They want to be able to pick them based on the abilities that they offer, based on the pricing that they offer, you know, Amazon may have the most services, but, but Azure is giving you the best Windows licenses, so I want to run on those respective platforms, and I want to be able to, pick, to deploy any application anywhere. And that comes with a, its own set of challenges, and uh, the number one challenge I'm seeing is that of silos. And it's interesting, when, when I talk to like, VPs of technology, like directors of cloud infrastructure, about what is the primary reason that's slowing them down in adopting the public cloud. You know, in the early days of our security, it's still coming up quite a lot, you know, in healthcare and, um, and, and um, finance, but it's certainly going down. You know, it's, there's the problem of skill set, right? But the, the new number one reason I'm starting to hear is lock-in, that they're saying, look, I'm not going to one vendor, I'm gonna buy real estate power, cooling, CPU, you know, the, the box, some, some infrastructure software, all from one vendor. And I don't want to get locked in. I want to have the ability to, to move my workloads around. And that's really, really hard because all of the IaaS level APIs of these cloud providers are completely proprietary, right? How I provision a, a VM on Amazon versus how I provision a VM on, on Azure, very different. Right? If you get into the sort of, you know, the, the, the deeper you go in the services, the bigger the, bigger the differences. So and, and this is a problem for, for the CIO because it effectively creates silos. Right? I now have an, an Amazon team. They go to the Amazon conference. They run around the Amazon hoodie, like the reInvent hoodie, right? and uh, you know, they, they're building to those APIs. Then I have the, the Microsoft team with a, with a you know, Azure backpack that's uh, writing to the Azure APIs. And I can no longer move team members around. You know, I've, now, I've now silos where each application sits in a silo and uses a different methodology. And I had one example we had, um, uh, of a customer who was on stage at VMworld in Europe. They talked about how if you, for example, have a firewall audit, you suddenly have four different firewalling technologies and they're four different clouds. And it's, it's really hard to get any kind of consistency across them, you know, let alone to demonstrate consistency to an auditor. So my first prediction here for, for where all of this is going is I, see, I think we'll see a whole industry of software evolve that basically helps enterprises to manage across public clouds. And that's starting to happen, right? There's companies like Datadog or, or Aviatrix, for example, that are providing, you know, like monitoring or networking across public clouds. So, you know, if you're interested in startups, I think there's tons of opportunity uh, in this space. You know, the, the second my second prediction, I want to leave you with three predictions here at the end of the talk. My second prediction is we're seeing the swing you know, from, from, um, from the central IT to the business units when it comes to making decision, purchasing decisions for cloud. Right? You know, when, when, when the cloud thing started, somebody in a business unit was writing an application, they were using their credit card, they were just signing up for Amazon, deploying this thing in Amazon. IT had no idea yet what the cloud even was, right? and, and these things happened very quickly. But I personally think this is a pendulum swing, and that'll swing back. And um, you know, again, let's look back in history. Everybody remember the PC revolution? Okay, everybody who's really old like me remember the PC revolution? Back then, the business units were buying the PCs, they were putting them under their desk, they were buying you know, like uh, Lotus or you know, the, the early applications in Office, and just started using them. They didn't even ask IT, right? Everything was, was driven out of the business unit. But then what happened? We had viruses, we had you know, like buggy software, uh, these things came harder to support, you had upgrade cycles, the spending became really large, and, and you know, central governance came in, wanted to get spending under control. And so the PC started being administered and, and purchased centrally, you know, Windows was started to ma be managed centrally. Today we've swung all the way back, many enterprises using VDI, you know, like uh, centralized desktops, they're completely centrally managed by IT. 
So I think the, the trend I'm seeing in enterprises is that, that the same thing is happening with the cloud, right? Well, it used to be everything in the business unit. Today, more and more is going back into IT. The centralizing purchasing, IT is managing more and more of this infrastructure. And then the last one is, I think everybody will move up the stack. And let me explain what I mean with that. So today, a typical enterprise stack is that you buy hardware, you put a virtualization layer on top for compute networking storage, and then you know, maybe management, and then you run your applications in that environment. And in the public cloud, that doesn't quite work anymore, right? Because the public cloud providers all have their own infrastructure as a service layer built in. Right? On-prem, you may be using something like VMware, but on Amazon, most people are going to use their, their Zen hypervisor and, and VPCs for networking, and uh, you know, like uh, an S3 or uh, Elastic File System for storage. And the enterprises are looking at that and are basically saying, you know, we're worried about this because we're now, we're now consuming you know, quite a bit of that technology stack from one vendor. We want to have a normalization layer that still allows us to deploy applications anywhere. And the application layer of choice that's emerging is containers. Right? And I think originally, the way I look at containers is they were really built as a, as a better tool to build a certain type of software infrastructure, like, like microservice-based architectures. But practically, the enterprise is starting to equate them with cross-cloud portability. Right? We're seeing enterprises that are taking a HANA database, sticking it in one big Docker container, and running it on a 256 gigabyte instance, right? which is not the original idea of containers uh, you know, in, in, in my mind, but they're just using this as a, as a portability mechanic. Now, but they, they, if that is the case, right, this basically means the entire industry will move up the stack by one layer, right? We'll start to have new virtualization layers for compute, it's containers, we'll have the same for networking and storage evolve on top of the IS abstractions, and new management layers um, evolve on top of that that basically the enterprises can take anywhere they want. So I think as somebody, as somebody phrased it, uh, cloud is the new hardware, right? And, and that just means we all need to move up uh, one layer in the stack in, uh, in order to use this. And with that, I'm not sure if we have time for questions. Um, I will say thank you. Thank you. So one question from the audience is like, how do you see public cloud versus private clouds evolving in the wake of VMware AWS partnership? And I guess there was recently another one between Redshift and AWS announced also on the other side, so. Yeah, so look, I, I think there's these, it's important to keep the different models apart, right? A, a private cloud just means you automate your own internal data center more, your colo space that you rent somewhere more, right? Um, what we are doing with AWS, what Microsoft is doing with you know, their Azure on-prem and, and off-prem stack, what, what, what Redshift is doing is that they're basically trying to offer from one vendor a system that works in both places, right? I'm looking at this as a, as a long-term interim solution, right? But I think that the really the, the far out future is probably gonna be to run natively on top of the public clouds with a, with a more high level abstraction layer.